Welcome everyone back to Let the Journey Begin. I am your host, Hillary Roberts, alongside with our executive director, my co-host, Alex Meshi. Hey, Hillary, how's it going? It's going great, man. I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm really excited about our golf tournament coming up. Yes, golf tournament <laughs> is coming up. The website is launched, so everyone can register, uh, come out and join us from the foundation alongside Epic Journey and a few other sponsors, um, alongside the Red Bull athletes that are coming to do some skydiving demos and things like that. So do check it out. There is a link on our website, www.redsongbird.org. Otherwise, go directly to the golf website to register, which is www.epicjourneyraising.com. But yeah, awesome. it's going to be a fun day. Full day of golf yeah. and a little dinner event. And uh, we'll have some speaking presentations, but it's going to be a nice little networking event too, I think. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. I will be um, just maybe driving a cart, stepping out and waving. <laughs> yeah, and flagging Greg down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Flagging my man. Oh no, babe, babe, pull out that other iron. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know the irons, the that, sticks okay. as you guys like to call it. I've just no pick clue. a number one through 10. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be just fine. And then also a couple cool things that are coming out on our website. We have some new trauma resources that are on the website. One is a quiz and uh, we took a little different direction in putting out a a small little lightweight quiz for the parents. I know that mm. there are a lot of kids struggling with school being virtual and, you know, social media kind of taking over. So we put some uh, red flags to look for in uh, children so that parents have a tool that they can utilize. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, um, do you, would you like to introduce our amazing guest for today? Yeah. So we've got, a great guest lined up for today who's got uh, an interesting story of how he actually got into recovery. So he'll get into that. But I'd like to bring on Andrew. Hi. Thanks Welcome. for having me. It's a Hi, pleasure. Andrew. I've been watching you guys for a while and we're listening to you guys for a while. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, we're stoked to have you. And uh, it's pretty cool because we just closed a scholarship through Gratitude Lodge uh, about a month ago. And it was refreshing to hear that you had actually gone through their program. I did. Yeah. So two years ago, I went through their program and, and I had an interesting way of going there. They helped me out with a lot of things that I didn't think I could get helped out with or felt like I deserved to get helped out with. Um, and they changed my life forever. You know, they really did. Oh. That's awesome. And I'd like to get into your story of how you uh, got into treatment. But before that, um, let's start off with the hard hitting question. Hillary, you want to hit them with it? This one's really intense. What did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, it depends <laughs> based on the week, I guess. I mean, I was one of those people that I would pick up baseball and then football and then basketball. And then, so I wanted NFL, MLB, all that stuff. I wanted to be, you know, a stockbroker at one point and all that stuff. And it, it wasn't until I got into the field that I'm in today that I was actually like, oh, this is what I'm meant to do in life. You know, um, I think it was like my alcoholism coming out at an early age, like not being able to decide, make decisions and and feel comfortable in my decisions. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, I mean, you look the part of stockbrokers, so you're halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what but, is it that you do now? So we want to know. So I do admissions and clinical outreach for Gratitude Lodge. Um, I oh, you do? Yeah. So I essentially you had Ethan on here. I work with him. Um, oh, my and, gosh. And so I, you work for the facility you went through. I do. Yeah. So I started there pretty much right when I got out, I started doing like what's called panels there. And I did that for months and, uh, I felt like I was like a volunteer worker there, you know? Um, and then my get well job was support staff with them. And then, uh, they felt confident enough to bring me on to the clinical outreach team. And I recently just got into admissions as well. well that's awesome. So I think it's safe to say that you believe in the program. Oh yeah. I believe it works for anybody who wants to work it. I mean, we're here to meet you halfway, but you've got to do your half. I think that's uh, very important when it comes, like people think they're just going to go to treatment and then all of a sudden life's going to get better. Like there's a lot of work that goes into it. You know, you put a lot of work into your addiction. You've got to put a lot of work into your recovery. 
but we're there to help right. and we want to help as many people as possible. I think that's where we're all on the same page with is like, as long as we're helping people, we're doing the right things. Yeah. And you know, you hit on something there, I think with about the amount of work putting into the addiction versus the recovery. Uh, we had another guest mention something similar. And I think the real cool thing about it though, is that if you do actually put in that hard work in your recovery, it pays out dividends, like huge dividends. Yeah. You get everything back. Everything that you could have imagined, you have the opportunity to seize it. Well, you get you get more than it back. You know, like we get the right. most of us get our families back. We get our, some friends back, but we get a, a, a sense of peace and really not without being too cocky, but a sense of confidence in ourselves that like I never had an addiction. Like even when I was like good at you know my bartending job I had before I got sober, I never had any confidence in it. I never had a pep in my step. Like. And today, you know, they're putting in work. Um, I have the confidence that I never thought I'd have without being like over cocky, you know, even if it does sound a little cocky. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having <laughs> high self-esteem, right? And getting that back. So I, right. I think there is a line between cocky and uh, confidence that if you're on the confidence side, there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's a great thing, you know, and, and you can see it uh, in the way you carry yourself. You know, Thank I you. see the confidence you exude confidence thank you that's thank great you. um but let's so let's switch gears a little bit uh you work for gratitude we assume that you believe in the program but let's talk about how you got there uh you mentioned before the show in just a little clip that uh it was a little bit of a different journey than most as far as what your brother did to you yeah so i'm a triplet and uh like part of my story is we wow. used together and then we got sober together um, you know, a couple months in between there, my brother started well, started a year before me, and then my other brother started a couple months after me. Um, and uh essentially what happened was uh I had reached my bottom point where I was like, All right, I have a serious problem here. Like this is gonna kill me. I reached that point and um so I, I called him because I knew he was in recovery. He told me to come out here to California. And, and just visit. And I was able to come out here and experience a recovery community that I didn't even know existed. Mm. I was one of the people who kind of like laughed at him for being sober. And so I came out here, found the recovery community and, and I liked it. And, um, but I was still living in fear. So I went back home and, and, uh, I did, um, a couple of different things that or try to do a couple things that just didn't work out. You know, I, I continued to reach back for the bottle or do whatever it was I was doing back then. And um, he finally came to me and said, hey, like, let's get an apartment out here. I'll get you a job. He's in mortgage. He he, he does very well. And I'm proud of him for that. And um, he's like, I'll get you a job out here. So just come out here. We got an apartment lined up. So I, I sent him a bunch of money to put the down payment for the apartment. It was like the last bit of money that I had, period. And uh set on my way out here. Me and my best friend drove all the way from North Carolina here. We drove out here. And by the time I got to Nevada, I believe I was in at that point, I was on my way to Vegas. I don't know if I was in Nevada yet, but I was like, I'm going to do Vegas before I get sober. Cause I wanted to get sober, but, um, and so we did Vegas and he, he calls me and he says, Hey, look, like we got to do sober living. We can't get the apartment yet. And I was like, all right, I guess it's fine. We'll do sober living for a month. And, um, that's fine. It is what it is. And then, uh, so I got to California, went to the sober living. I drug tested and I failed. And they were like, well, you have to go to detox if you want to li live here. And I said, forget that. And I went down to Newport Boulevard and, and did my thing for a couple of days until I ran out of everything that I had. Um, and I remember I was in the parking lot there and I was by myself, um, getting high and, um, it was without a doubt the lowest point of my life, just not in terms of like the materialistic things. I had already lost everything, but in terms of that emotional and mental stability, I had lost it all. Um, I was just crying. And I, I think it was a holiday in parking lot. And um, so I made the call and uh, the owner of Gratitude Lodge, Mark Williams, um, met up with me and got me into treatment. Um and I remember going up the steps of, of the house and my idea of treatment before this point was like hospital psych board type deal. 
And so like I knocked on the door and I was like, this isn't gratitude lodge. And I walked back. I like literally <laughs> went back to the Uber and I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Um, and they were like, no, 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 you're in the right place and everything. And, and, um, so that's how I got there. Um, hmm. that's kind of just like, and then in the meantime, my brother took a trip to Istanbul, um, and bought a bunch of like Louis Vuitton stuff with the money, not a bunch of one bag, Louis Vuitton bag with the money that I had. Cause he essentially knew I was going to treatment. We were never getting that apartment. <laughs> and so, wow. So when I ch- get out of treatment and go back to the sober living and he pulls up with the Louis Vuitton bag and I'm like, Hey, where's my money? He's like, I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, he's got the Louis Vuitton bag. So, oh my God. Uh, so I got a question for you. You said you drove out here with a friend, right? Yeah. Was that friend just dropping you off and turning back or where did your friend go? He flew back to North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. So, wow. uh, yeah, he's my best friend and he still is even in sobriety. We keep touch. I, I had to make um, some amends to him and, and, and really rework that friendship. And, and now our girlfriends both got pregnant four weeks apart. So we're about to have a, a kid basically together. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Wow. So I have a question and I, I want to go back a little bit. I want to go back to the first time you drank and how like how it all started unfolding. So I get to where you're like struggling, but I want to know how how it started and how you got to that struggle point before you drove and all that. My addiction started when I was 13 years old. Um, I took a painkiller in the bathroom of Olive Garden outside of a mall. And I don't know what <laughs> prompted me to do that. Um, it was, I guess it was being like an, imp- like I could be peer pressured, right? Because I wanted to fit right. in. I wanted to mm-hmm. be a part of, And so if someone was like, here, take this, I was like, well, are you going to be my friend if I take this? Okay, cool. Like, so I'll take it. And Mm -hmm. um, so that was my first experience with drugs. And I kind of, I guess it would be my experimental phase. You know, I started smoking weed after that. Um, I did like, I did like the weed a lot for a (laughs) while. Um, Mm -hmm. But then I found when I was 16, I was at a friend's house and there was a bottle of peach pinnacle vodka and it was like my first time actually drinking. Like I had had a sip of beer from, you know, like my dad or something like that. And, uh, but it was my first time actually like experiencing that taking the golf and it goes down your throat and you feel the warmth and everything. And when I felt that, I felt like I could breathe for the first time in my life. Right. Like I felt like I had found the answer to all my life's problems, all the, all the, cause I, I went through some trauma a little bit. Uh, when I was 13 and um, I never really felt a part of, I never felt comfortable in my own skin. But when I took that sip, I finally was able to breathe and feel comfortable. And I wasn't able to feel that again until I got sober and and worked a program, went through treatment and everything and started helping others. And now I have to continue to help others in order to continue to breathe. That's how I view it, at least wow. in order to hold on to that feeling. Wow, that that's powerful. Um, if you don't mind, do you mind sharing what your trauma was at thirteen? Yeah, so I had um, I had a friend who had a brother who um, sexually abused me and and had me do things that I didn't want to do, um, and it really put me in a place of I guess awkwardness and uncomfortability for a really long time. Um, I would say mm-hmm. about ten years, it, it threw me in a downward spiral. Um, and it was because I didn't feel like I could talk about it. I didn't feel like a man if I brought it up, right? So like as growing up as a child, and my dad always said it as a joke, but I took it literally, like, don't tell me about the pain, show me the baby, like show me the goods, it doesn't matter about the pain. And in order to be released from the pain that I was feeling, I had to talk about it, you mm-hmm. know? And, it, and I was surprised with how many other men have gone through a similar situation of this. And over time with talking about it and and, trying to use that to help others, I stopped being a victim and became a survivor. And that's some, anyone who's been through sexual or trauma, abuse trauma, when they can start to make the turn from, you know, a victim to a survivor, it's honestly, in my opinion, the most powerful thing that you can see in a person. It changes someone. Yeah. You know, and I, I think oh. after you're telling this story, it's something that I can relate to. Cause I had an incident in sixth grade. Fortunately, I was able to get out of the situation. Um, I just, it was one of those things where you feel all the shame and you know, the kid that I was with was one of my best friends at the time, Yeah, you know, and it's like, how could you put me in this position? Right. And then they normalize it to the point where 
you feel like you're the one that's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you did something to provoke the situation. Yeah. You know, and not only that though, like there was a part of me that loved being the victim. Like, you know, if you had my life, you would drink too. You know, if you had been through what I went through, you would drink too. And that was my excuse. That's what my brain took and ran with was like, all right, as long as I'm the victim, as long as something's happening to me, I can continue to drink the way I'm doing or pick up a drug and do it the way that I did it. Cause I did everything alcoholically. Like I, I tried meth and cocaine and MDMA and I did it alcoholically. Like I was going to do it until I either passed out or I died. And Mm -hmm. it reached that point where like, I didn't want to die, but if I did, I was okay with it. And I'm wow. today, I'm not today. I'm like, I have a lot left to do on this earth and I want to do it. So it's felt, uh, it's almost as if you felt like there was nothing more to really live for at that point is what it sounds like. Yeah. And I think you reach that point when you live as being a victim, mm. right. Mm-hmm. Versus being a survivor. So how well, would you say that your mentality has shifted now that you're on the survivor side versus the victim side? The biggest thing is, I don't really try to think of myself. I try and think of others. And and we talked about it a little bit uh, before the show, when we were getting coffee about the purpose you feel of helping others, right? Like when I told my story to the first person and I could see that they were relating to it, something in my brain clicked. And I was talking about being able to breathe again. That's what clicked was the fact that like, I found other people who felt the way that I felt and made it out. So I have no excuse to, to say, well, I went through worse than you. Like we went through identical situations. We felt and thought the same thoughts. And it was, it was time to stop making excuses for myself, you know? Yeah, you know, it's crazy to think that you were originally from North Carolina. You've been living in my town for only six months. And here we are in the same room after, what, 20 years since I had my experience. Yeah. That we had similar experiences. Yeah, go you know? Tar Heels, by the way. Right? <laughs> yeah, I decided yeah. to throw that in there. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's no, crazy I, to your point, the relatability. Yeah, yeah and it's it, it connects people on a different level than I feel like a lot of other things can make you connect with a person. Like, I meet someone who has that story, and I'm like, here's my number. Call me at 3 a.m. I'm okay with that. Whereas if I meet you, and I'm doing like, if if I just meet you, like, if I meet another dad out there, and I'm like, if you have kid issues, call someone else first. Don't Don't call me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Call Jason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> First of all, thank you for honoring us with that because it has been a difficult journey for people in general to open up on these pre- specific traumas, and that was like the first focus of the foundation until we expanded out. And then, but for women, it seemed to open. Up, we're able to open up about these things, but then now that men are, and so thank you so much for being that example and speaking so freely about it. And I, and I say that you're not just a survivor, you're also a thriver because look at all the things that you're doing. And that's, you know, cause I wanted, and that's the thing I wanted from all my traumas that happened. I wanted to be more than just a survivor. I was like, okay, I, I, I know I survived this because that, to me, survive didn't sound but I wanted to, th- I didn't know I could thrive and see you're thriving. You're about to be this dad, your family stuff. I mean, it's just so amazing. Yeah. And it's it, it really, it, like you said, like thriving, like, all right. Like I was always told, like, at least in treatment, like, Hey, it's not your fault that you're an alcoholic, but what are you going to do about it? It is your responsibility to fix it. And I, I kind of took that kind of on with my sexual trauma too. I'm like, look, it's not my fault that this happened, but what am I going to do with it now that this is part of my story? I can either let it destroy me and send me to the grave and I never deal with it, or I can get out there and help people and and help people get out of that mindset that I was in. I love that perspective. And I feel like that's a lot of what the Red Songbird Foundation embodies in in our board members and our ambassadors and the people that are running the day-to-day stuff. You know, all of us have had some situation or, you know, scenario unfold that brought us all together to want to do something about it. But the crazy part is that we've all encountered something, right? And while our stories may be special and individual, we can relate to somebody. And off of that platform, we're trying to reach as many people as we can. 
Yeah, and so, there's a lot of people out there that you can relate to. Like, if you start looking for the similarities versus the differences, like, there's a lot of people that, like, you are unique as a human being, but, like, how unique are you, you know, in terms of your story? A lot of people, like, just being a human in general, you go through ups and downs in life, you go through trauma, you go through hardships, like, you go through triumphs, you go through successes, and, and that's a part of everyone's story. So, like, when I find that I'm not being able to relate to someone, it's because I don't want to. If that makes sense. Like I have to be able to be willing to to relate to somebody because we all have we all share this common thing that is life, right? We all go through it. No one's life is like sunshine and rainbows. I don't care if you grow up in Beverly Hills or you know the east side of LA. You know we all yeah. go through struggles. Yeah, that's, that's an right. interesting and way to put it. I am. Um, I I wanted to ask you a couple of things. When did you know you had to get help, and what was your moment of clarity? Yeah, so I had gone through, uh, I remember the day, because it's my grandma's birthday, that, that I realized that I needed to get help. Now, I didn't successfully get sober and start to change my attitude towards life at that moment, but it was without a doubt, like, the day that I was like, holy crap. And it was, um, you know, I went to the ACC football championship. Uh, I got plastered drunk. I fought my best friend. I, like, punched through a taxi car. I got cuffed, talked my way out of that. Went back home, like tore door hinges out. And I don't remember it, ever doing all this. The cops got called again. I talked my way out of it again. And I woke up the next day at my parents' house, not knowing how I had gotten there. And then they drove me over and I could see like the glass, all the broken glass, the broken doors. And I was like, holy crap, someone's got to get over here and clean this up. I don't know who did this. And it was me that did it, mm. you know? And, um, at that point, none of my friends were talking to me. My family was like, you got to get your stuff together and get out. And um, I just, mm. I got to the point where I was going for three months at a time and not knowing what I had done during those three mm. months. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's and when great. I got that moment, I was like, all right, I need to do something about this. And I tried a bunch. I was one of those people. I had to try a bunch of different ways before I finally found the right combination that worked for me. And I, I'm stubborn, so I didn't listen to others at first. I tried to do it my own way. Mm -hmm. I was like, maybe I can do, like, the Cali sober thing and smoke weed. And I don't judge people who do that. Like, if you do that and that's your thing and you're a better human being and you're able to not, like, do fentanyl and stuff like that, that's, that's all good for you. But I have to be abstinent because everything that I do, I do alcoholically. You know, if I smoke weed, like, I'm going through an ounce two days, you know? <laughs> Like guaranteed, I promise. I don't that's know how I do it, but it's all, it, like, <laughs> how do you and breathe? I don't and I don't have the money for that. That's the thing. It's like I don't I don't make enough money to do that. I never have. I probably never will. <laughs> and um, yeah, but it was it was a really defining moment in my life. Like I kind of view my life in a couple different chapters, and like that's the big pr page break right there. It's like all right, you're beginning a new life. And it doesn't start good, right? Like that moment that you realize you need help, like it's a really bad moment in your life. And I remember just being like, holy crap, I hope it never gets worse than this. And it hasn't yet, you know, but if I go back out, it probably will. Okay. So then that led up to you essentially being tricked into this apartment, your yeah. apartment turning into a Louis Vuitton bag mm -hmm. and you ending up at formal treatment at Gratitude Lodge. Yeah. So from there, as soon as you walk through the door, I mean, what were your feelings? What was your experience like? Mm. I was really high, so I don't really remember the first day. But I do <laughs> remember there was a guy who walked up to, to me and he said, welcome to the best decision of your life. And looking back at that now, it is without a doubt the single best decision I've made in my life was going there. Um, but I remember, uh, you know, waking up the next day, uh, pop. Like I had a bunch of like popsicles, I guess, all over me because I had eaten everything because I hadn't eaten in a couple of days. I was like using my last bit of money to get drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like just so thankful to eat. And I woke up the next day and um, Claudia, who works there now, uh, just sat it and talked with me. Right. And was like, hey, I'm here to listen. And I needed that because um, it got me to open up and start talking about the pain and the trauma and everything. And they have such a particular way of showing people that they care. Like when you, when I was there, 
I felt like it was a family, right? Like I was in a house that had a cook come in and he didn't just cook. He was like, you know, I'm going to cook, but you're going to have to help out. We're going to do this together. And then we're going to sit down. We're going to eat at the table. And that meant a lot to me. I don't know why Mm -hmm. it did, but it's something to this day that stuck with me. The the fact of like, I finally feel like I'm at home. Mm. So it sounds like you got this sense of community that may have been not there before. Yeah. And support mm-hmm. group, right? People that are there to genuinely help. Like they wake up in the morning and their first thought is like, what can I do to help someone today? And I wanted that. Like, cause I had been so sick of just like waking up and being like, how can I play the victim today? Mm-hmm. And then about how long into your stay at there, did it start to click in as to what you were doing? I would say about two weeks before, because I wanted to continue to smoke weed when I first came there, right? And they did a really good job. And I guess it was also like the people that I was in there with too. Um, they they got me to a point where I could listen. And I listened to other people's stories that had been there, like that had been to treatment, you know, multiple times. And they told their stories. And I was able to hear, like, I was like, their thought process, which led them back into here, is the same thought process that I'm having right now. So I need to change that. And so I went into the therapist and I had I had questions. Like I was like one of those people that like when I went through treatment, because I, I did treatment after Gratitude Lodge as well. I did like 125 days of t- treatment in total. And then I did sober living after that. But I was like one of those people that came in and I had like 20 questions. I was like, we're going to play 21 questions today. And figure out who I am, why I am that way, and what can I do to change that. And what came as a result of that? The result of that is, and we talked about it before, like, I needed to start experiencing that, opening up, and then experiencing life sober to where I was, like, helping other people, to where I was, like, sharing my story, to where I was no longer in shame and guilt and, and, and felt like the victim of. And in that return i got like this eternal happiness that i can't describe to someone i couldn't even describe it to me when i first got sober like i always tell people two things when they when they come into treatment i'm like one this is the one thing i can guarantee you that the grass is greener on the other side if you do the work you put the work in we'll meet you halfway i promise you you'll you'll like your life a thousand times better than you do now and two if i ask you right now what you want out of sobriety you will sell yourself short Because you can't even, when you're in addiction, you can't even imagine how good this internal peace feels. Like you can't, because you've never felt it before. And until you feel it, you don't understand it. Hmm. All right. Well, on that, since uh, we're running out of time here, if you could pull together everything that you've gone through, what would be the best action for the day or solution someone can do right this moment or today Mm -hmm. that can get them one step closer to where you're at? Find something to be grateful for, right? Mm -hmm. Start trying to learn how to have gratitude in action, right? Like I used to say, you know, I have a good family and all that stuff, but like to feel that and express that to them, like I just, I'll randomly text my mom and be like, hey, thank you. And she laughs at me, but like, I genuinely feel that. Or my dad, I'll call him. He's a, he's a pilot. I'll call him and I'll be like, hey, where are you at? You're not in LA today? He's like, no. I was like, all right, I love you. Call me when you're here. Cause I just want to see them. And start to live yes. life on a daily basis and gratitude, right? Be thankful for the things you have because everybody has something that, at least that I've come in contact with, they have something to be grateful for, whether they realize it or not. Start living it. Absolutely. That is so beautiful, Andrew. Thank well, you so much. we're almost out of time much. here. We'd love to have you back to talk a little bit more about your experience with treatment so that some of our audience that may be on the fence and hesitant or reluctant because they don't know what's on the other side to have someone explain that I think would be super helpful. Um, but until we get there, where can people find you? Uh, people can find me at uh, Andrew at gratitude lodge.com, or you can look me up on Facebook, Andrew Schaefer, S C H A F F E R. Like if you're struggling, just reach out. You know, I'm always here for someone who felt the same way that I felt before. Like my phone is open 24 seven. I'm, I'm tough to wake up, but once I wake up, I'm there. <laughs> so like I'm Hillary. a little groggy at first. I know, know that's Hillary all day long. <laughs> yeah. 
But but trust me, when you reach out to me, it helps me more than it helps you. Yeah. You know? Amazing. Well, oh thanks so much thank for coming you so on. Much. And I thought we did a good job today. So thank you for having me. I'm well, I'll come back anytime. This was great. I had a great experience. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. I think it was great that we went down the trauma line and yeah. talking about guys opening up about trauma. Cause to your point, that is a rarity, you know, more guys need to come forward and talk about it. Not so much to put it out there for other guys, even though that is helpful, but more so cause it's self-help, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. Andrew mentioned, as soon as he was able to talk about what was going on, it was a sense of freedom and relief and he could breathe like all the yeah. weight was taken off. No, and we hear that so much. You know, I appreciate um, and I I so appreciated your honesty too, my friend. Oh yeah, you know, my situation's a little bit worse because it didn't transpire into the full blown of what it could have been. You know, fortunately I was able mm-hmm. to get out and uh left it at a broken friendship, you know, but mm-hmm for the better in my opinion. And besides who'd want to be friends with me after I just gave him a black eye, you know, Ooh, it was, yeah. it was like that sense of discomfort, not just awkwardness, but I'm just like, this isn't right. Why are you doing this? And right in, right in the face. <laughs> a lot of the survivors wish they would have done that, you know, you know, or, you know, but again, everybody's different. There's nothing wrong with, us that we didn't, but I love that you got out of that. That makes me happy. So. Yeah, absolutely. So another great episode of let the journey begin and another episode that I get to steal the spotlight. Yeah, we love it. You're fabulous. You're absolutely fabulous. And do you want to let everybody know all the places they can find us? Yeah. So everyone can catch us at www.redsongbird.org. Otherwise follow us on Instagram or Facebook on Facebook. We are the red songbird foundation. And on Instagram, we are also the Red Songbird Foundation. So come follow us, see what we've got coming out. We've actually got some pretty cool trauma uh, tips and tricks that will be unrolling Mm -hmm. in the next couple weeks. We've got the Epic Journey Golf Classic on May 28th. And then stay tuned for a couple other fun things that will be rolling out here that we have to keep a little bit of a secret. Bye-bye, everybody. (laughs) Bye, everyone. (laughs) 